when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there alone, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed straight over the embankment. <laughs> the pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> the telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> I love this last one. The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. <laughs> well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's an indeed a pleasure and honor to be here this morning. You know, it isn't often that a guest pastor follows another guest pastor, especially someone who has been a bishop in the ELCA, Paul Blum. So, uh, it's, it's indeed. Uh, he's probably a synod assembly. I didn't go this year, even though it's close by in San, in San Marcos, uh, because, in case you don't know, when you're a retired ELCA pastor in this synod, uh, you have to throw your name into a hat, and they draw out like three names or six names. That's not so bad, but they have to pay it all away. So <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, do I want to lose once or twice or not at all? I chose the former. You know, I can't count on a loser that way. Uh, I'm Pastor Fred Hill, recently retired. Well, not so recently anymore. It's going on two years. I don't know where time goes. Uh, living in Sun City. I'm a uh, six-time naturalized Texan. People say, are you a native Texan? I said, no, my wife is and, our, and my two daughters are. I'm a naturalized Texan. I lived in Beaumont, Port Arthur, Houston, Houston again, uh, then came back to Houston a third time. I don't know what that's all about. We won't go there. But I did come back a fourth time just to see if it was okay. But about two years ago, my native Texan wife said, Brad, 37 winters in Chicago gets three, four too many. They promised me three of these. So we came back to Central Texas to be uh, both uh, reconnected to our roots. This is where we met and married, uh, having met at Concordia College back in the early 1960s. Did I say it was that old? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then uh, my wife's family, they, they all live in Sun City, so I'm not sure what that's all about. But here, here we are, so getting deep. Uh, I've served uh, uh, as a campus chaplain both in Houston and in Chicago, uh, as a nursing home chaplain in suburban Chicago, Park Ridge, and then in the city of Chicago, and then uh, the Chicago Bishop saw fit to assign me to do interim ministry work. I'm one of those guys, you know. I comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, depending on the day of the week and the time of the day. So, uh, Eleven of those, one was in Houston, three were in Central Illinois, and another seven were in Chicago. So here I am, and I'm waiting the Bishop's phone call, even as we speak, because earlier this week they said, you know, we may need you. And I go, okay, you know, you think so. so. Uh, I enjoy uh, being in different churches. I've been here, I think this is my second time here, first time for a meeting. And uh, if you want to know more, you know, you can email me or we'll talk later. So, Our text this morning is from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And uh, my supervisor on internship, or as they would call it back then, Vicarage, told me that uh, of the 66 books of the Bible, someone said, what should I read? And I read the Psalms. And I said, well, there's two other books I would encourage you to read. And one is the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And then if you have a little time energy left over, pick John, the fourth gospel. I love John. I love John. He just uh, does all of these magical, mysterious, and marvelous things uh, this morning. But I have to begin this morning with a story. A story that illustrates uh, uh, and kind of explains, I guess we would say, uh, the central message, the theme of, of today's gospel reading. A man uh, who sat by a pool for 38 years, waiting, and he had become probably desperate by now after 38 years. But 38 years, I mean, he, he devoted a chunk of his time hoping, hoping beyond hope that uh, something would happen in his life, something special, something miraculous. In real life, in real time, there's a man named Jake, much like the paralyzed man on the mat, who was walking down a deserted California beach, 
full of depression, desperate for some message, some clarity as to what God had in mind for him. He had thrown away all of his relationships, his career, his life was in ruins. He was on the verge of filing for bankruptcy. And then, at age 55, he stumbled across something half buried in the sand along the shoreline on the eastern coast of the Pacific Ocean. At first, he didn't pay much attention, but on second thought, he said, Oh, what's this doing here? This object sticking up out of the sand. And so he reached into the sand and pulled out a very sandy, kind of ruddy looking bottle and he noticed that well it looked like something was inside the bottle a message in the bottle so he uncorked the bottle and he pulled out this weathered note in the bottle and the note read to whomever finds this note i will give half of my estate and he's going uh yeah and it was signed daisy alexander dated june 20th 1937 but he's about to throw the note away and toss the bottle aside, and uh, on second thought he said, well, I guess I'll take it home. So he took it home, he put it on the shelf in his closet, and he forgot about it. Now, a couple of days later, he was uh, in conversation, he had no more friends, perfect stranger, and the stranger said, well, tell me, Jake, a little bit about yourself. And he said, well, what? You want to hear about my life? You know, no one cares. And so we talked about, you know, this recent walk along the California Beach, and then he found a, a, a message in a bottle, and the guy said, uh, well, what was on the message? Well, and Jake said it was a message about someone offered half of an estate, and it was signed, Daisy Alexander, and this stranger said, Daisy Alexander? That name rings a bell for me. Let me think for a moment. And he said, oh, yeah, I get it. Daisy Alexander is, is one of the heiresses to the singer sewing machine fortune. She's probably worth many millions of dollars. So Jake comes back home and uh, he uh, gets on the phone, he calls his attorney and he says, you know, this may sound totally off the wall and unbelievable, but I found a message in the Bible and uh, I, want to, I want to see if it's going to go anywhere. So the two sat down, Jake and his attorney and Together they hired an oceanographer, and uh, he said, okay, he found a message in a bottle in California, and Daisy Alexander was from the UK, and that was in 1937, this is 1955. I estimate that, uh, you know, water could travel from the Thames River, you know, up through the North Sea, and down through the Bering Strait, and, you know, down the west coast of California, and it should take somewhere between uh, 15 and 20 years, and it's only been 18. So, uh, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story is, Jake filed a claim and received $12 million. So what's the lesson? A message in a bottle, a bottle placed in a closet, a perfect stranger comes along and says, pursue, pursue what you might think is a total waste of time because one never knows. By the way, Powerball is up to three hundred million dollars again this week. In case you want to relieve yourself of two bucks or more, what is it about some people who are so determined against all against all common sense? I mean, a man who sat paralyzed by this pool, this Bethesda pool by the sheep gate, hoping for a miracle to happen. And he saw the miracle happen. He saw the first come, first serve, the person who raced by him and jumped in the pool when the waters were stirred by the angel. He did not get better, but perhaps he had hoped that maybe all these other people who were, who were infirm, blind, and lame, and deaf, and dumb, that, you know, before too long, he'd be the only last man not standing, but sitting, and uh, it would be his turn. How many of you here have been in France to Lourdes? You know, I was there, what, four or five years ago, 
and uh, I mean, it's it's a real tearjerker to go walking in through the beautiful gates up to the cathedral and seeing these people in wheelchairs and on crutches, you know, coming to this infamous place of healing. For us, maybe it's uh, Brackenridge when we need a trauma one, or maybe MD Anderson Hospital when we have been diagnosed with cancer. A man with a broken body, but beyond the broken body, what was his spirit, his mind? What was his will, his relationship between God and himself and, and with others? How many of you have heard of the word insanity? Insanity? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, that's the psychological definition. But if we look at insanity from a spiritual standpoint, there's a phrase that I would add to that. And that is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting the same results or even different results, but avoiding, avoiding contact with God or, and through the Holy Spirit, God's people who might, who might help us. And as a result, by ignoring that relationship, we end up hurting ourselves more than, as Jake found out, walking along the seashore. What happens with our human relationship? Now, I'm not going to uh, stand here this morning and say, all of us are insane. That would be a little bit over the top, especially since I don't know you, I've met a few of you before the service. But I think there are elements, there is a smidgen perhaps, a small amount of our life that is not completely whole. And I'm not going to see, ask for a show of hands or ask anyone to stand up and, and talk about your own personal experience. But I would assume that in one way or the other, either we have experienced some brokenness or we know someone who has and we go on from there. Or at least we make a valid attempt. Well, here are some examples kind of to pick your interest to elevate, raise your curiosity about some things that just might be broken. It might be something that we remember. We remember. And uh, the healing just does not occur. I went to a conference in Toledo, Ohio many years ago, and someone said, remember the good old days were not nearly as good as I have remembered them to have been? We carry carry the past with us. And some of the things about our past, some of our family values and traditions are quite helpful. But from time to time, sometimes our past gets in our way. Remember when? You know the definition between being young and old? When you're young, you ask, Mom, Dad, when's Christmas? When's my birthday? And when you reach about age 50 or more, you say, I don't remember when my birthday was. <laughs> but you know, our memory does cloud our decision. Secondly, if we turn everything inside of us, guess what happens? It has a way of exploding, if not oozing out into the surface, or maybe, Pastor, you know, this, there's this knot in my tummy over here, you know, and I've been to the doctor and I can't find anything physically wrong with me. And now I'm not eating well, I'm not sleeping well, and uh, I just don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. We harbor ill will and feelings that have both damaging physical, if not spiritual, results. And then there are those who feel empty inside. My heart is heavy. Pick up one of the Psalms and read them. And the vast majority of the Psalms of the 150 talk about being sad in heart, heavy of heart. We can't put our finger on the reason, but we know something isn't right. 
And then we go to our psychologist, we go to our pastor, we talk to a good Christian brother or sister, they encourage us to read the Bible, to have a stronger devotional life, and we're saying, I already got enough burden, I don't need more on my plate, we come to worship, we take communion, and nothing seems to help. We decide to up our pledge for the year, we give more to charity, we try to devote free time to acts of kindness and mercy and justice, and still nothing works. And then we turn our attention to God, not for help. God, why did you allow this to happen to poor little old me? And then there are what I call the smorgasbord. I guess I can say that in a, a Swedish Lutheran church, right? The smorgasbord, you know, of everyday issues in our life. You know, well, it's, it's just a little late in a pain. I can handle it today. You know, just give me a, a bag of chips or another helping of chocolate. Or dear, would you run over to H-E-B and buy some Bluebell? That'll make me feel better. Or you take a bit. Perhaps you heard the story of the recovering alcoholic. The more he drank, the more he drank. He mixed vodka and orange juice. And every day after his cocktail of orange juice and vodka, he'd wake up with a terrible headache and angle. And he'd say to himself, this is a bad mood. And the move I need to make is to find out, you know, what's going on here. It must be my whole cocktail, my recipe of vodka and orange juice. And so he said, I think I know what the solution is. I'm going to trade in the orange juice for grapefruit juice, and then I'll feel better. We come up with our whole remedies, our whole spun version of how to feel better. And so we do the same thing over and over again, like this man of 38 years, day by day, going to the pool, sitting there watching the world spin around him, watching others get healthy, while things never change in his life. So one Sunday afternoon, the preacher was visiting one of his uh, more mature members of the congregation. And they're sitting there on the front porch in the rocking chairs, and the old hound dog is lying there quietly on the porch. First thing you know, that hound dog gets a little restless, and you know, squirms and whatever. And the preacher says to his member, is your dog all right? Oh, yeah, Reverend, he's just fine. You know, he just gets a little restless from time to time. The preacher said, well, he seems to be a little more restless than the last time I was here. Well, Reverend, you see, there's a nail sticking up from the wood in the porch. And I guess he lied down on that nail today. The preacher said, well, have you ever thought uh, about pulling up that nail or bending it over to the flooring. Oh yeah, but I figure if it hurt that old dog enough that he'd be smart enough he'd move to another spot on the porch. Let's admit it. When the pain gets bad enough, maybe, just maybe, we'll move to another spot. But if we sit in the same spot long enough, guess what? It becomes not only familiar, but we become emotionally unable to move beyond that spot. This man in Jesus' story was unable to move because, first of all, he was physically paralyzed, but over time, he could not see another spot. Because he had sat in that same place so long, he saw no other way out of this situation. He hoped beyond hope that maybe someone would lift him or that the angel would come while he was closer to the pool than he had been the day before. He was hoping to get well. He was hoping that a miracle would occur on his terms and his timetable and 
not God's. And so Jesus comes along. When I was working in Central Illinois back in 2011 and 2012, the youth director at uh, St. John Lutheran Church said, I want everyone here in the room to recognize when you see Jesus. And everybody kind of went, huh, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He said, if you saw Jesus, would you recognize Jesus when and if you saw Jesus? Jesus comes up plain and visible in plain sight and says to this fellow, so you want to get well. You notice Jesus says well. He doesn't say healed. He doesn't say cancer free, open arteries, no angina, no memory loss. He says you want to get well. Perhaps you've heard the story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. I like it. I've heard it a number of times. But I think it's fair it's worth repeating. So Holmes and Watson were hiking all day long, and at the end of the day, they were tuckered out. They were ready to sit down, share a meal, fix their tent, and try to get some sleep out of the while. Deep into the night, Sherlock awakens. He sees stars in the sky above him. And so he nudges Dr. Watson and says, Watson, look up. Look at the sky. Look at all the stars in the sky. Yeah, said Watson. Holmes says, well, I have a question. So when you see all those stars in the sky in the middle of the night, what does that mean to you? So Dr. Watson thinks for a moment, he says, well, as an astrologist, I see Leo and Sagittarius. As an astronomer, I see millions of galaxies. And maybe there are billions upon billions of stars that I'm not even able to see tonight. Look at my watch. Chronologically, it tells me it's a little past three in the morning. And theologically, it tells me God is great and awesome all the time, and we're just a small, a small portion of His creation. And as one who studies the weather is a meteorologist, it tells me, gee, the weather tomorrow is going to be dry and sunny. Holmes is silent for a moment. And then he says, Wrong, Dr. Watson. It means that someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> what do we see? What do we see when we open our eyes? What do we see when we see Jesus? Do we say what we began with this morning, our confession, that our life is broken and that only Jesus can make us whole and well? Secondly, would Jesus say to this man in our gospel lesson and to us, we need to stop playing the name and blame game. We can name the problem and we can blame ourselves and others all in the blind awful. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not a big fan of city parties. In fact, if someone comes to me and says, well, I'm going to complain. i got seven minutes, brother or sister, and then we're going to move on, you know. Thirdly, so who do we listen to? Who defines who we are? I could spend hours here telling you where I'm broken. Most people don't know that I have been blind in my left eye since 2001. They go, oh, I didn't know that. I said, well, that's true. Well, how do you manage? And I go, well, I still have 80% of my vision. Well, but you lost vision in one eye. I said, no, I have 80% of my vision. Well, how can you 
you say that? Forget it. Forget it. So Ruth and Billy Graham. You know, Ruth, may she rest in peace in the Lord's uh, you know, eternal love. And Billy, what is he, 90 gazillion years old? And Clint mm -hmm. Carroll just turned whatever, like 90-something. So they're driving along one day, and they must have been uh, in Central Texas because Guess what? They found themselves in a construction zone. Can you imagine that? <laughs> they had to slow down. They had to take detours. They had to switch lanes. They were in stop and go traffic. And then they were in stop traffic. How can you have an 80 mile an hour speed limit and find yourself parked in a parking lot? You know, that's Central Texas, right? <clears throat> well, finally they came to the end of the construction zone. And, uh, and, and Ruth uh, nudged her husband, Billy, and says, isn't it great? You know, now we're free. And he says, yeah. And she says, but now I know what I want people to talk about when the Lord calls me up yonder. And Billy says, wow, we're driving along, you know, we're now free from all this construction. She said, yeah, I know, that's why I know what I want written on my tombstone. When the Lord called me home. And Billy said, Well, where'd you get that idea? She said, I got it from the sign. It says, End of construction. Thanks for your patience. Now, how many people do you know? How many people do you know who live that way? I have met a few people. I have been privileged to pastor dozens of people. And occasionally I run across someone who lives that way realize they, they live in a construction zone and God offers them patience. If anyone here thinks that you have arrived, well, you may want to get on your hands and knees and have a kind of Jesus moment. Because whether you're 2 or 22 or 72, God still has something in mind for you. And when we are weary and tired, when we are at our wit's end, whether we're sitting by the pool watching people just race by us, ahead of us into the pond, or whether we are walking along a California beach, not expecting to find the empty bottle with Daisy Alexander's note in it, those things may not happen. But I believe Jesus through the words of John the Evangelist is saying to us today, see me, take my hand, stand up, and walk. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks today that you value us and honor us enough to come to us and invite us to a new life with you. We thank you that you do not violate us or force us to be different than who we are, but that you make us an offer that we simply cannot refuse. Help us to work on our refusal. Help us to say yes when you invite us to be well. And we ask these things in the name of our loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.